Welcome to Break Through the Ordinary Podcast. Are you ready and committed to your future self? If you are, sibling duo Mark and Claudine Tremonte will take you on a journey of self-discovery to unlock your highest potential. Through impactful conversations with entrepreneurs, thought leaders, coaches, and healers, we will share practical tools and tips to generate the life you envision. New episodes drop every Monday. And welcome. Our amazing guest, Brett Eaton, is a life optimization coach, speaker, author, owner, and founder of the Better You Blueprint Coaching Program and co-host of the podcast, The Better You Blueprint Podcast. Brett believes life is meant to be played on offense, not defense. His goal is to help as many people as he can play offense in their life by creating a life that they are excited for. Brent's superpower is helping men and women identify and prioritize their professional goals and align them with their personal interests to create the life they truly want. Brett thrives on inspiring and impacting people to ask better questions, dig deeper, break out of their comfort zone, and create new standards for their life. Sounds good. Welcome. Thank you, guys. It's a pleasure to be here. I appreciate you having me. And, and even hearing that back, sometimes we hear our own bio. We're like, oh, wow, like that. I, even that's, that sounds impressive. But, it's, but it's, a, it, it's humbling at the same time, being like, oh, wow. Like, that, that's what we do. That's what we get to do. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it is. Very much so. Can you just share with us your journey of becoming a coach in this program and framework that you have? Absolutely. So the, the backstory is ever since I was little, I had been into sports, been into athletics, things like that, and went through a couple of major injuries from young high school all the way up to through college. And I spent a lot of time in physical therapy. So my, I went to school thinking I was going to be a physical therapist, came out of school really more interested in the strength and conditioning side of it. Just loved staying around athletics. I loved being around athletes. I loved being around kind of that space. And because I was rehabbing a lot, I had my own personal love of fitness and care and realizing how good the body feels when it is doing what it's supposed to and eating what it's supposed to, and also the opposite of, of how poorly it can feel. Fast forward about 12, 13, 14 years in the fitness industry, I started to get this feeling of, I like what I'm doing. I felt always felt lucky because I would hear friends and everybody complain about like, oh, they hate their job and they can't stand going. And I never felt it that bad, but I just knew that I was playing small to, to put it, you know, I didn't know it at the time, but I was like, what is this feeling that I have that I want to do more? I want to be able to help more people. And as a personal trainer, for those who know is you only have so many hours in your day. So you are either putting more and more and more and more clients and working more and more and more to have the impact, or you have to figure out another way to reach more people for less time. And that's when I started to have this craving and saying, okay, the clients that I love working with most are the ones that are not just here for fitness, but they like having the mindset talks and they like talking about confidence and they like talking about habits and routines. And I felt that that was really my superpower was how can I tap into these people beyond just their 60 minute workout and really start to have an impact on their life. And that's when I started to say, maybe that's really where my passion is. Maybe that's where my strength is, is to help people on this bigger scale. So over the last six years, I've transitioned to coaching. And now, uh, you know, obviously, a lot of things are virtual, but it allows me to tap into people in that fitness space still. But really, it is a much more well-rounded, holistic type of lifestyle change. Thank you. Def yeah, definitely holistic nowadays. Yeah, we realize it's all incorporated. So what, what principles do you bring to your coaching? And, and maybe you could say how you brought about the Better Blueprint and what it's about. Yeah, so... The, the fundamentals that we try to do is that we need to have good habits. Habits are going to tell you who you are. And, and if somebody has poor habits, they're, it's going to tell you a lot about where they are and the things that they're going through. And people who have really good habits tends to lead them down the road that they want to go to. So one of the biggest fundamental pillars of my coaching in the program is we have to create a life that we love and, and not just on Saturday and Sunday, right? <laughs> we need, we need, we need to have the Monday through Friday part built in there as well. So it's creating a life of not necessarily balance because I, I struggle with that word, knowing that sometimes we have to be out of balance to get what we want, but we really want to have a lifestyle that we're having fun. It puts a smile on our face. We're waking up feeling inspired, but also that we're doing the things that we know we should be doing that are going to lead us to long term happiness, not just long term, but short term happiness. And the Better You Blueprint was really put together, not just based upon the things that have gotten me out of my hardest times and gotten me back on track and 
I know my Instagram handle and my website are motivated by Brett, but I wasn't born motivated by Brett. I think that's like the author ego that has come about. But it's putting those things together so that you can create that life that you want and and just giving people the tools. And the, why I love the word blueprint is because there are some actual structural tools that every person can use that are just going to get them to a place where, hey, there's no way you can be doing all of these things and not finding the better version of yourself. And I, I named it the better you blueprint over the best you blueprint because I don't know if we'll ever find the best, right? We don't know if we can ever get to that version. But I always think that there's an opportunity to be better than yesterday or be better than the person we were last week. You'd mentioned it's one of the pillars. Is, are you open to sharing the other pillars, the you know, habits? I, I agree with you. Like, right? We are what we practice. <laughs> Absolutely. There's always going to be a wellness element to it because it's just what I've done my whole life. But I also have realized that the people that I look up to, that I've studied, that I've researched, the ones that have found success, which is different for everybody, but the ones that have success and their health are the ones that are truly wealthy. You know, the ones that are truly happy and successful. I've worked with a lot of people. I've seen a lot of people research a lot of people who had the success on paper, but don't have their wellness attached to it. And there's always something missing. There's always something missing there. So wellness has to be a part of it. And, and when I say wellness, it doesn't mean being in the best shape of your life, but it's being in a place where we wake up and we love ourselves. And we're in a place that we're happy with, with what we're doing the habits that we're doing, what we're eating, sleep schedule, water, like all of those things are built into the wellness side of it. And then the last part is just making sure that we understand what we're chasing in life and that we're chasing the things that we actually want. Words like success, words like fulfillment are big words that we use, uh, passion, making sure that people are doing what they want to be doing with their life because we really don't know how much time we have. And I know that that is, is a drastic perspective but at the same time, we don't know how much time we all have and, and how much time we have on our clock. So we want to spend as much of our life doing what makes us happy, doing what fills us up and doing what gives us purpose. Those are the people that are making the biggest waves in the world. And everybody has that inside of them. So we try to tap into that and the better you blueprint as well. Do you believe that there's certain skills or maybe mindset that I'm going to say high achievers, high performers really have to have or best to have to leverage? Absolutely. Absolutely. I have, I have a lot. I'll give, I'll give like the three because I do think that there are more characteristics than there are not. One of them would be you have to track and measure. You have to have trackable, measurable ways to, to view your success. People who, who don't measure or track anything, they're really just hoping for success, which is different than measuring your success. There's a lot to that, but everybody that comes through a program or everybody that works with me, we set goals. I'm a big goal person. I believe in goals. I think it gives them their North Star, but then that's only part of it. And I think that that's where the everyday person struggles, especially come a time like end of the year, beginning of the year for people where we're setting all of these new goals is we set the goal, clap our hands and we're like, we did it, right? We set the goal. There we go. It's like, hold on. Well, now we got to reverse engineer and figure out what we have to do today. So tracking and measuring to make sure, are we getting closer to what we want to achieve or are we not getting closer? Perhaps are we going the wrong way? The other thing would be delayed gratification. Being okay with not getting something immediately because it's going to be even better down the road. And I call that choosing commitment over comfort. If we can choose commitment, the thing I committed to do today over what was going to be the easiest on me or what I feel like doing because my emotions are telling me to do this. Well, high performers follow through with commitments even when they don't feel like it. And they're willing to say, I don't want to do this right now, but delayed gratification, I'll do this. But down the road, this workout, it's going to matter in the long run. Sending these 10 emails is going to matter in the long run where I don't feel like doing it now, but if I can be better at delayed gratification saying, and you know, all of this comes back to, there are times where like, you just want the apple pie, right? Go eat the apple pie. There are times where you need to spend the weekend on the couch, go spend the weekend on the couch. But most of the time we need to choose our commitments over choosing comfort. And the, the last one I'll give you is just, I call it brutal self-awareness. High performers are brutally self-aware. They are not going to convince themselves that they're doing more than they're actually doing. They're not going to convince themselves that they're also terrible and they're, and they're the worst person on the planet. Their self-talk is very regulated. 
they know that they're good at something. They know that they are going to follow through when they say they're going to follow through. But when I say brutal self-awareness, I would say that is the number one characteristic of change. If you want to change something, we have to be aware of it. So when people come in the first week of my program, I call awareness week. We have labeled it awareness week, where the first thing that we're going to do over the first week is I want you to be overly aware of all of the things that you haven't been aware of before you got here. I want you to be aware of when you tend to be motivated. When are you not motivated? When do you tend to eat well? When do you tend to reach for the snacks that you know you shouldn't have? When do you tend to follow through when you don't want to feel like it? And when do we tend to just choose the easy road? I want these things to come up early because now we can increase that person's self-awareness. Can I go a little deeper? I, I've never heard it put as brutal self-awareness. And that may be a muscle for people. So here you have a week that you focus on it in the blueprint. And I'm not saying it's not brought out in the rest of the program, of course. But how do we, you know, when you think of top performers having brutal self-awareness, what do you think is help building that and keeping that? Because that's, I mean, to have that self-reflection, you know, is there a way that they're building that? Is there like a way to continue to nurture that? And, and so that it, like you use the word regulated. I, I like that word for, for, for if you could speak into that a little bit more. You're totally right, Claudine. And I believe that, and it, to me, self-awareness is very similar to accountability. It's getting that internal accountability. But I always coach people that, internal accountability is actually not the best place to start. If we want to make a big change saying you should do it just because you told yourself to do it, don't worry about telling anybody else, don't write it down, just like have it inside and follow through. That's really difficult place to start. What I try to have people do is start with as much external accountability as you possibly can. Tell somebody that's going to hold you accountable, hire a trainer, hire a coach, work with somebody who is going to have the awareness for you well, you can start to build that big internal awareness because we can always see things. You guys can see things in my, in my, you know, in this guest bedroom here that I can't see because you're just looking at it from a different perspective. So having those different perspectives early on is a phenomenal way to start to be more self-aware because what happens is somebody's telling you what they're seeing and you're like, oh, I didn't even realize I was doing that or I didn't realize I do that every single week. And having that person, what that can do is Having that soundboard allows you to be more self-aware. It's the best way to increase your self-awareness while also creating that external accountability. So how can groups and individuals be more effective with their time management and creating their goals and following through? You started to touch on it, so a little deeper maybe. Absolutely. It's, it's first prioritizing. What do we actually want? What do we want to do? I think we fall into the trap often of, of telling ourselves we want something and then not really backing that up with action, with commitment, with scheduling and all that. So we have a multi-step process when it comes to commitments. But to basically walk through it is the commitments that we make every week should be a piece of that big goal. So whatever our big goal is that we're aiming for, our commitment should reflect that in a, in a much smaller way. Saying if we want something by the end of the year, well, we should have what is the one week step that we can get us closer to that point. And then I believe the game changer is really dedicating a specific time to it. When it comes to time management, if the reason why we're both here is because something was on our calendar that reminded us that we need to show up today. I'm going to be with Mark and Claudine. I need to be here. If it wasn't on my calendar, well, it almost becomes a decision then. Meaning I, I may show up, but it's not blocked off. So maybe something else could fill that time. We want to make sure... I would never do that to you guys, by the way. <laughs> but... But we do want to make sure that those things are blocked off because when they're blocked off, I believe that they prove it to not just ourselves, but prove it to the universe that you're saying you want this and now you've put a dedicated time in your schedule for it. So what we do is we prioritize what we want in life, then put those in the calendar first. Let's put our priorities in the calendar first, then build this crazy life that we want to build around the outside of it. But Scheduling is underrated as far as how often it happens. And most people are really likely to schedule their work. They're not as likely to schedule their family and their kids and their workouts and their self-care. That stuff needs to go on the calendar. That's how we become somebody who follows through with the things that we really say we want is by finding time for it. So what do you think gets in the way then of people... I hear you, it could literally be like, I didn't put it on my calendar. But if we go deeper than that, what do you think gets in the way of people having what they say they want, want to have? Life is set up right now to be highly distractions. Like there's just so many distractions that we can get distracted all the time. So 
when we have, when we don't schedule those things, again, it becomes optional. It's still optional. It's, Hey, I said I was going to go to the gym at five. It's not down there. So technically I could probably do whatever I want right now. Half hour goes by, hour goes by. Next thing we know, we didn't do that thing that we said we were going to do. Where if we learn to follow through with our schedule. Now, I want people to understand that as you get more self aware, you're able to be structured and be scheduled, but also flexible because life is going to happen. Things are going to have to move around. But early on in my program, I say that we can move things on our calendar. We can't take them off. So if we put a workout down and something crazy happens and we can't do it, well, what happens is that workout needs to find a home in the rest of the week. If not today, it better be tomorrow. It better be somewhere else. But we're not going to delete it because we don't want to get used to saying that was a commitment and now I'm just going to throw it away because I don't feel like it. What happens is we have to learn that follow through process. We have to learn that the commitments are going to be things that we follow through with. So yeah, time management is really just a full lesson in avoiding distractions, creating boundaries and learning that when we write something down, it really has to mean something. So to go one step further is something that a lot of people could benefit from learning is let's also not write down things that we actually don't really want. And that's a big part of coaching is helping people take things off their plate. Let's get less distracted. You say you want this, this, and this, but everything we've talked about, you actually only want one of those things. So the other two are just distractions. They're just time wasters at this point. So let's narrow down and really only put the things down that we're actually passionate about. Yeah, thank you. It reminds me of that saying, right? What you say yes to, you say no to something else. You say no to, you say yes to something else. In owning that. Yes owning it, stepping into it and realizing that a lot of people are saying yes to things that they know that they don't like to do, know that they're spending time with people that they don't want to spend time with, are doing these things where if we start there, just think of that, of how much more time we would have to follow through with these other things. So it's really getting clear on, and there's another module that we do that's energy. And and energy is another thing, is, is who are we spending time with? Are they energizing or are they draining? So we literally do an exercise where people will write down the five people they spend time with, the five activities or places that they spend the most time in, and they label them. And then that gives us a very clear of how can we spend less time with the drainers and doing the draining activities? And how can we fill our day, fill our week, fill our life with more of the things that are energizing? The clarity. Yeah. The clarity and focus is incredible when you do that. Wonderful. So You've been through some adversity in your life. You were sharing about all the injuries and stuff. So how can people take their adversity and bring it into an opportunity or a place in life? Oh, yeah. One of my favorite all-time lines is adversity now, advantage later. It's a line that came from getting to the other side of a lot of the big adversity that I've faced in my life. And it's a great line. It's hard to know that when you're in it. When you're going through something really tough, when you're going through a breakdown, when you're going through an injury, it's very difficult to be in that injury or in that moment and say, you know what, this is going to be so good for me. (laughs) Because all you want to do is not be in that situation. But looking back on our lives, if everybody who's listening just paused for a second and said, what were the most impactful, biggest adversity that I've ever been through? Those were the biggest definers of who you are today. Those were the things that created you, that gave you your perspective, that has made you one of 500 billion, however many people are on the planet, is knowing that, is that you have been through something very specific. There may be people who have been through that also, but not the exact amount of things that you've been through and in the order and at the time and in the phase. So for me, that line always helps me when I do face a challenge that because it's a line that I repeat to myself often, I'm a little bit more equipped to face that challenge just because I know something's testing me here and I can't wait to find out what it's going to give me. I can't wait to find out what I gain because of this adversity because I'm going through it for some reason and on the other side of this, I am going to be a new person. It helps get through those tough times just a tiny bit easier. I just want to follow up on that. So I hear that, but it's hard for people to get that. Even, even after you explain it. So do you have any ways that you work with people? Or how do you get, because some people can go through the adversity and never get to the gift, right? That, that's a great point you make, Mark. And it's, it, for most people, it's very difficult. And for, for me, it's difficult. Like I coach this and sometimes in the moment, I'm still like, what is this teaching me? This isn't teaching me anything. <laughs> but going back to go forward. So sometimes you might actually have to write out, tell me what was one of the the worst things that happened over the last five years. Tell me, tell me one of these big moments. And then 
actually forcing you to write out some of the positives that came from that. Write out something you gained from that. Write out something you learned from that. What has that given you a new perspective on? And as terrible as most things are, there's always a silver lining to something. There's always a lesson in there. And by getting them to actually admit that, hey, there actually was something that helped me there, or I now know to not do that, or I learned, you know, for people who maybe have been through a divorce or something, it's, well, I learned what I don't want when it comes to love, right? There's still a lesson there that you can take with you into the rest of your life. So it's really going back to go forward, Mark, as far as they need to do that lesson a couple of times to prove that, hey, wait, actually, maybe there is something. As much as it's clouded, you know, clouded up by a lot of negative stuff, there, there was something that came out of there. You really talk about putting it down on paper. And I know I have a challenge of that. So it's really helping me or making me go, oh, I have to put it down. And, and you really, I want our listeners to know that it's really important to put that. Actually, this could be a challenge. This is perfect. Like put down your list of things you want to get accomplished or whatever it is. I haven't come up with it yet. We can I actually come together. like the adversity when that actually Brett's speaking into is if we go back in our last five years, let's just say, what is one of those really difficult moments in your life? And you just said it. What did you learn from it? What was the shift in perspective? Or if you haven't had the shift in perspective Maybe it's, what did you learn to get through it? Because there, the gift could be in that. Claudine, that's an amazing point because it may be, it may not be this thing you gain, but maybe you have, maybe there was a character trait that you learned about yourself or a skill that you had to create or somebody you met during that crazy time. I'm going to, I'm going to just turn my camera here and, and point to that guitar that's over there. That guitar has been with me since I was 16. And that guitar came into my life at one of the worst times ever, an injury that took me out of sports completely. And the reason why I point to that guitar is I never would have learned to play that guitar if I didn't have to take a year away from sports because of a really bad back injury. And what was one of the lowest times of my life turned into something that I'm not great at guitar, but I could pick up and play a song if I learned a little bit. Is like That's given me a gift that I have with me still today that never would have came without that adversity. Now, I would have traded the guitar immediately for the sports back in a heartbeat. But now that's something that I, I'm now I'm in my 30s. I can still play. I'll, I'll hopefully still be able to play for my kids, my grandkids. That's a gift. There was something in there that came because of something in my mind that was tragic at the moment. Okay. So then the challenge is adversity to advantage for all of us, either what you've learned or what, you know, it's brought forth in you. And if you do that challenge, please tag us at the BTO podcast on Facebook or Instagram. I love that. And I just want to also ask what you had brought up, Mark, is, is it literally writing it down? Because I do believe there's a mind-body experience when we put pen to paper. And this, we've come to learn from neuroscience, doesn't have the same experience. And this is the typing. And we also, a lot of people do dictation now, but there is a different energy. So do you literally have people in your program, like you want to see, not like you're checking out his homework, but that they really are writing their narrative down? Yes. Okay. I'm not as strict as writing it with a pen. I do think that that is powerful, but it needs to be written down because when, when things are up here, and when I say things, it could be ideas, it could be struggles, it could be challenges. When they're, when they're stuck in our head, I call it the mental blender. And when a blender is on, you can't usually see what's in there, right? You can't see the ingredients. You have to stop it, let everything settle, and then see what's actually in there. To me, when we keep things in our head and when people are like, oh, I know what I want in life, but I just, you know, I haven't written it down. To me, it's still confusing. We still can't actually see what's in there. What do we really want? So by journaling or writing it down or speaking, I do think there's really a lot of power in speaking too. But when we have that outlet where we can tell somebody, bounce things off, it becomes more real and we can actually see what's going on in there and get some clarity on it. So for a lot of people who love to journal, what they do is they're like, I'm so confused. I don't know what's going on. And they write it down and they're like, ah, that makes a little bit more sense because I've had to slow down, put it somewhere, and then you read it back. And all of a sudden, you're like, I didn't even know that that's what I was thinking about. In coaching, this happens all the time where somebody comes, I ask a couple good questions, and they talk themselves and like, oh, thank you so much for all the help. And I'm like, all I did was ask some questions that you needed to talk through. And by talking it out, they come to their conclusion. They come to their answer, the thing that they needed. So I think we all need to have that person that we could either have those transparent conversations with, be completely honest, be completely open. For people who maybe don't have that person or don't have that coach in their life, well, then the pen and the paper is going to be your best friend. 
because getting that out, and it doesn't have to be this formal journaling experience, but just getting it down, just start writing. Write down what are you feeling? What are you feeling? Why do you think you're feeling that? And where are these feelings coming from? And it could be also helpful for things like the adversity and the advantage and just unpacking. It's a great way to unpack. Yeah. Thank you. I like it. Mental blender and unpacking. Good taglines. Yeah. You know what I thought of when you were talking about adversity and you said like, sometimes it's just, it's that there's a gift that like, say I looked at having heartbreak. It may have taught you how to love or you never thought you could or whatever. And so you're learning even from that. So that's great. There are always going to be those moments that you learn something on the other side. And I use a, it's funny for, for not being like a relationship coach, there's so many good analogies for relationships. And you think about how for a lot of people, dating is really difficult. It's like, it, it takes a lot of emotion. It's hard. You got to put yourself out there. But every date that we go on, if we view the adversity of going on multiple dates as hard and draining and terrible, well, it ruins the whole experience. And sometimes we forget why we're going on the date in the first place. We're going on the date so we could find the most amazing thing in the world, which is love. But if we think about every person that we've ever been on a date with, well, they've helped us get more clear about the person that we want to end up with. What can we put up with? What can we not put up with? What do we love about somebody? What are characteristics that we need in a partner? Well, every date was actually super important to find that end person. Or for people who are still looking, the date that you went on last night that was terrible was important because it showed you what you don't want. And sometimes that's just as important. So there is always this, this advantage that you're going to get because of it. And, and I also think that this goes back to high performers. High performers do see it as an advantage. And the great part about an advantage is if Mark and Claudine, if you don't think that I have an advantage, but I do, guess what? It still works. I believe that I have an advantage. So it's helping me whether anybody else believes it or whether it's actually true or not. So realizing that you have that advantage is powerful. Sure, sure. I, I want to take it in a little slightly because what I'm also hearing is right our own awareness. You went back to that, high performers. The other place that I know, uh, you know, when I looked at your website and when I was on your Instagram is you also speak into confidence. And if you could share with our listeners some of your philosophy about building that and, and, you know, maybe some of your motto around that. Yes. You know that this is one of my favorite yeah. all time <laughs> mottos here. This, this is it. This is where we get excited if I wasn't already. But the c confidence is something that we often try to measure it as in black or white. You're either confident or you're not. I don't agree with that. I believe that everybody has a certain level of confidence in certain areas of their life. We all have areas of our life where we would love a little bit more confidence. You guys are having me on the show right now, and I'm talking about all the things that I love. But if you ask the question on quantum physics or molecular biology, I would be not very confident in my answer. I would not have a lot to say. So when it comes to confidence, the, peop the areas that we are not so confident in, I've come up with this beautiful saying called the ABC method. And I love the ABC method because I really... When we figure it out, it is as simple as ABC. And the ABC means action builds confidence. It's the reason why I love that is because so often we want the confidence to go do the thing. If, if I was not confident coming on a podcast, what would happen is I would, the 10 minutes before we started, I would be trying to psych myself up and be like, where's the confidence? Where's the confidence? I need it to get on this podcast. Well, what happens is being on the podcast is going to have me walk away with confidence. I get it by doing the action. So, so many times people spend all this time and energy trying to build the confidence so they can go take the leap, start the new side hustle, leave their job, leave a bad relationship. Well, what happens is the confidence comes after the action. So it's not confidence builds action, it's action builds confidence. So for everybody out there listening, why I get so fired up about there is it is an immediate return on your investment when it comes to action. You take the smallest step of action and you're going to immediately feel better about that thing. You take a big step of action, well, now you get big confidence back from taking that leap or doing that, trying that thing, whatever it may be. And I also noticed this, that, you know, when we take the, the step or the leap and build it, it's then how do we stay in that action, right? Because it's like one podcast, okay, it built my confidence, right? It's like, how am I going to stay in that action, right? To me, it's a muscle on some level. It takes practice. And action needs to be followed up with more action and, and more action. And, and, and it's a slippery slope, but that's how we get things done is we just keep moving. And we take that small action and every step that we take, 
becomes easier on the other side of it. So it's important to understand that any action is good action. If starting small is better for you, start small. If you're somebody that has to jump in with two feet, jump in with two feet. But it's always going to give us that ROI on that confidence. And, and it's confidence in a lot of areas. It's confidence that maybe that wasn't as bad as I thought. Maybe it wasn't as scary as I thought. Maybe, you know, we can convince ourselves, oh my God, the world's going to end or I'm going to die if I do this. And then we do it. We're like, wait a minute. Not so bad. Still here. World's still ticking. It's like, hold on. That wasn't as nearly as bad as I thought. So it can be a slippery slope, but in a good way. We want it to be a rock rolling down the hill as far as to get you moving and to get you closer and closer. I feel like some of my clients will try it and then they judge their action. And it almost diminishes it. And I'm thinking of what you said before about even the dates, that even in action, it doesn't result in, you know, your outcome you searched for is still a step towards your ultimate goal and the confidence because you learned like, oh, okay, so that didn't build my confidence or that didn't go well versus it being ah, like black or white with it. Yeah. I mean, you could stumble your way across the finish line, right? You can be crawling across the finish line and you're still going to get across the finish line. Brene Brown, if you're familiar with her, has this beautiful line for starting things. And I'll save the language, but it's FFT. And it stands for effing first time. And she goes, the FFT is always going to stink. It's always going to be bad because the first time for anything is going to be, we're going to judge ourselves. It's going to be hard. It's going to be so difficult. We're going to wonder why we're not good at it right away. But, the, but you have to get through the FFT. You can't get to step two until you get through the FFT. I remember hearing that and that's always stuck with me and something I've passed along to a lot of clients is like, embrace the suck. <laughs> like, it's going to stink this time. We got to embrace it. And we got to get to the point where let's just go through this first one. It's not going to be great. It's not going to be pretty. But on the other side of this is confidence. And on the other side of this, it's going to be easier, always easier the second time. Yeah. Yeah. No, thank you for that. Yeah. And I love the idea too of seeing the gift in it also takes out this narrative people put in it, right? Like you, I'm hearing you say you prepare them for the narrative, like the first time's hard, but not doing it is also hard. And I tell my clients that all the time, like choose your heart. <laughs> choose your heart is a great line. And it's funny how a lot of people may think of this and be like, well, that's interesting strategy for a coach is convince them it's going to stink. But I'm not going to convince them it's going to be beautiful and awesome the first try. Like, is that the other side? I don't think that that's the right strategy. Somebody may think that that's a strategy, but to me, it's like, if we go into it knowing it might not be that super comfortable, well, let's go in, let's embrace that. Let's set our realistic expectation for what we're going to feel. We go in there, we feel all of those things. And then the beautiful thing is now the second time is going to be that much easier. Now it's not going to feel as bad as it was that first time. So and again, to back to a relationship analogy, the second date with somebody is always easier than the first it, because we know that person just a little bit more. We're a little bit more comfortable. So going back to that, that action and the beginning action, it's going to be, it's going to be the FFT. It's going to be a little messy, might not be beautiful, probably not going to be, but it, but it is still a very important and impactful step. Got to Got to get into action. Love the ABCs. <laughs> I think we often think it has to be this massive action, but it doesn't, it can start with these small little pieces that we just jump a little. You don't have to jump off the cliff. <laughs> you don't, you don't. And Claudine and I were in a, a coaching program where, you know, they teach the, the baby step, right? It doesn't have to be this. You don't have to quit your job to start a podcast or to start a side hustle. You don't have to, you don't have to blow it all up. Some people, that's just how they work. Some people are like, I need to go two feet in. I need to completely go cold turkey, whatever it may be. But that's the beautiful part about coaching is you get to find out what, what does this person need? What is this person's tendency? How are they going to best be successful? Are they, do they need to take 10 tiny baby steps or are they the type of person that to really get them going, they need to take the giant leap, right? They need to take the big jump and figuring out what, what type of person they are to get momentum, to get them moving. We're going to transition to some fast fire questions. Do you have any daily habits and routines? Yes, I do. Uh, so I start every morning with a 16 ounce glass of water within the first two minutes of waking up. Um, I believe that it, one, it gets your body rehydrated. So hydration is a big thing. First place most people go when they wake up is usually their bathroom. So I keep that. I have every client put a 16 ounce glass in their bathroom filled with water. And before they leave their bathroom, they're drinking that. So that is definitely one. I will usually work out in the morning, some mornings. I've actually kind of 
been testing out almost an AD morning routine where one of them I wake up and work first, one of them I wake up and go to the gym first, and they're both valuable for their own kind of elements there. But um, I always drink. So back to water. I, I, I aim for a gallon of water a day. I try to get some kind of movement in, even on rest and recovery days. Movement could be a walk. Movement could be some stretching. Um, but I try to get my body moving. I'll always uh, look at my daily commitments for the day. So I'll spend some time at some point, usually right when I start, just looking over the things that are most important for the day. And I kind of put them into a category of MITs, which are most important tasks. So I'll take a to-do list maybe for the week, or I'll take a task list for the week and I'll pull out, okay, well, these are the only two or three most important tasks that I need to do today. And that helps me prioritize where should I start. It helps me say, well, let's not do five things. And then I really didn't do any of the important ones. It allows me to say, okay, what's the priority order for today for, you know, whatever day it may be and pull those out. So I would say I'm a, I'm a, a very routine and I know what works and I know what makes me feel good. Now I want to also point out that it's not always easy, even though a routine you may have done for weeks and you doesn't mean it's easy. There are plenty of mornings they wake up and that 16 ounce water feels like a waterfall and the gym feels like, you know, the biggest struggle in the world to get to. But I know that on the other side of those, okay, well, I've done this enough times to know that as bad as I feel right now, I'm going to feel better after both of these. Get to the other side, get the reward, start a happy day. Do you call it M I M I T S? M I T, most important tasks. Mm, I like that, M I T S. How do you define love? Oh, love that question. Love that question. <laughs> um, I think it is something that. Ew, that's a great question. It, it is hard to define that. Mm. I think it's just something that you feel in not just your head, but your heart, but you, in your intuition too. Your gut comes into play here for just knowing that something is aligned. It's knowing that you're, it's a safety and it's a passion. It's a safe place. I think that love is really a, a safe place for people. And, and when I think of love, I'm, I'm thinking of the people in my life, but I'm also thinking, the love of doing what you want to do every day or the love of looking in the mirror and, and loving what you see and loving the person that you're becoming. That, I don't think I've ever been asked that question. That is a really <laughs> good question. But yeah, I think it's a passion. I think it's a, it's a safety where when you're with people that you love, you do feel safe. You feel open. It's a genuine caring for them. And it's also a, a feeling. You, you care for those people, but it's also a feeling that you can't necessarily put your finger on, but you know it when you're there. You know that those people have something for you? It's a great question. Thank you. Uh, so what is your secret to living a fulfilled life? I think you need to be doing things that light you up. That if you can't have good energy doing what you're doing, you're probably not doing the thing you're supposed to be doing. Because I do believe energy is a choice and a choice that comes from a lot of other choices, right? There's a lot of things that come into energy, but living fulfilled means that you're climbing the ladder that you actually want to climb. And for a lot of people, like climbing the ladder is a very business term, but I think a lot of people are climbing the ladder in their life, their relationships, their health, that they actually don't want to get to that destination. So fulfillment is really making sure that we're going down a path that we actually want to get to the destination. And I ask people right now, pause for a second, think about your career, think about your, your relationships, think about your health and say, like, is the path I'm on right now going to a destination that I can't wait to get there? Or are you going down a path where the destination is not a place you want to be? That's fulfillment. I believe the fulfillment is making sure that we're chasing that success with fulfillment. I think it was Robin Williams who, or actually it was Tony Robbins about Robin Williams who said, success without fulfillment is the ultimate failure. And I, I, I truly believe we need to have that fulfillment. And in a lot of my presentations to companies and stuff over the last year with everything going on in the world is, is I, I put up a slide that says that is make sure we're not just chasing success, but make sure at the end that there's fulfillment too, because without it, it really is the ultimate failure. We worked so hard. We did all these things for the success, but if we don't get fulfillment, we're going to still be empty. Right. What do you want your legacy to be? I want my legacy to be that when people were around me or when they listened to me or they watched me or whatever, that they felt something. And I know that that's vague, but one of my, the quotes that I live by is, is, is people will not remember what you said. They'll not remember what you did, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. My Angelou's quote is that is something that I believe my legacy is going to be. And, and we all want to create something great. We want to impact many lives, but I really believe that like when your last day comes and people are funneling into the, whatever it is, the church or, or around whatever it may be is, is I want them to 
to be there because I made them feel something. They're not going to remember what I said. They're not going to remember, Brett said this one, but no, but, but they're going to remember that, man, this guy hopefully made people feel good. And he brought a good energy. And, and I really pride myself on my energy and only want to be somebody who fills the room with energy. I never want to be a drainer. I never want to be somebody else's, uh, you know, steal from anybody else when it comes to that. So I believe that my legacy is going to be when somebody hears my name last day, when they hear my name, what did, what do they feel? And, and hopefully they feel something, something really good because they knew me or they know my name. They know my family. They know what I did and what I, what I stood for. The, the warm feeling I just got. Yeah. Um, who is the person who had the most influence on creating who you are now and why? Who, I mean, it's got, it, I know this is kind of a bailout question, but it's got to be mom and dad. Dad, for all the things he taught me and also the things that he didn't teach me, he passed away when, when I was 16. And that was one of those big adversity becomes your advantage because I don't, don't believe I would be the same person I am today through all the good and the bad if he was still around. Because he taught me so many things at an early age and, and to be 16, there are plenty of people out there who would, who would love to have 16 years with a father, right? And then maybe they didn't or, or maybe their dad wasn't such a great person in their life. But he taught me a lot in those 16 years to know what I'm not a dad right now, but I would love to be. And he's already taught me a lot of things that, that I know that I want to be. But it also showed me some tough lessons of I, I want to take care of myself to make sure that I'm around a lot longer than he was. So there's a lot of lessons in there too that I learned that have allowed me to make choices in my life now to live a certain way, to eat a certain way, to, to show up a certain way, to say, I learned that lesson, but that's not necessarily the lesson that I want to play out either. The other person in that same situation would be my mom. And just the, the amount of adversity that she went through, I believe I get my good energy from her because she never put her problems on anybody else. She just never allowed us to, to not have a chance to be happy, supported us fully all the way. And seeing that just made me realize like, that's what being a parent is. That's just like true love. That is just caring about people on, an, on another level. So I, I, I am very, very grateful that I've had two amazing parents that both taught me different things. And it's easy to think why I want my legacy to be what it is, is to also remember that that last name is attached to other people. Thank you for sharing that. So as we wrap our time up today, is there some parting wisdom you'd like our listeners to have or a principle or anything that you would like to share that maybe we haven't explored today? Yeah. For the one is the action builds confidence because I think that's going to get people going in a, in a great way. And hopefully everybody heard that and said, oh. That one area that we want more confidence kind of came to the forefront and they said, that's, that's the area maybe I need more confidence. The second one is just is realize that we don't have to change at all today. I think sometimes we hit these moments where we want to change everything in our life all at once and we just can't wait to make those changes. The changes happen small and small changes are still really important and really impactful. So I would ask somebody to say, what's the lowest barrier of entry for you? Meaning, what is the simplest change that you can make that's going to have a big impact? If it's health and you're thinking, you're sitting there listening right now and you're thinking health, I would say start drinking more water. Lowest barrier of entry, you probably have access to water and it's going to have the biggest ROI or the biggest return on investment in your health. If it's your business, if it's your career, maybe you just look at some new jobs, right? Maybe you just put your resume together and that is the action that says, hey, maybe I'm not fulfilled here, but that's one step that, that proves I don't have to end up here. So it's taking those mini steps and momentum is real. And I believe it's either going forward or backward. And we want that positive momentum as much as we can. So if you've had a tough week, tough day, tough, tough month, just know that you are literally one decision away, one good decision away from being back on the positive momentum. You're one decision away. You've had three bad meals today. Guess what? You have a good dinner. You're back on track. If you've missed a month of workouts, guess what? You work out tomorrow, you're back on track. It's realizing that it doesn't have to be so catastrophic. We can think of it as we're actually really close. And, and I say this and I actually mean it, but I believe everybody is one or two decisions away from a completely different life. One or two decisions, one or two important decisions away from a completely different life. So hopefully people hear that and feel, feel a little more inspired that they're not as far away as they may think. That's a good one. I like that. That's, that's motivational right there. <laughs> Thank you, Brett, for, for spending your time with us, sharing your wisdom and your passion, your energy. You really, it's one of the things I really appreciate about you is you do leave people with a different vibe than when they first came into your space. So 
I appreciate that. Thank you, Claudine. And I appreciate you both. Thank you, Mark. Uh, I, I love, I love getting to share. I love a good conversation. You guys are really good at what you're doing. I gotta, so I gotta step my host game up. I can tell. Uh, but I just really appreciate this. I love good conversation. You guys ask phenomenal questions and I appreciate the ability, uh, to, to be here and share with you guys. Yeah. Having your wisdom. Thanks. Thank you. And you know, you can find out more about Brett in the show notes. But for today, we want to say thank you for listening to the Breakthrough the Ordinary podcast. We hope you enjoyed this episode and a deep dive into, you know, wisdom so you can live your extraordinary life. If you'd like to support the podcast, please leave a rating and share with others on social media to catch the latest from us. Follow us at the BTO podcast on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And thanks again. Until the next time. Bye-bye.